All right, welcome everybody. The Kitzur uh, Shulchan the abridged code of Jewish law, chapter eighty-eight, and we are up to number fifteen, Tesvov. Fifteen. So uh, hopefully these laws will remain theoretical, because <clears throat> as as you know, we've been discussing muksa meaning something that doesn't have a purpose on Shabbos. So therefore, we're not allowed to move it. So test valve number 15, mace, a, uh, a corpse. Also the Tautula B'Shabbos. Now we can't move it on Shabbos because uh, obviously this has no purpose on Shabbos. We're not able to bury it on Shabbos and there's not really anything else we can do. Avol, however, you can uh, remove the pillow or something from beneath it. That it shouldn't, um, you know, decompose uh, to help keep it cool. In other words, Yazis. As long as we don't move any limbs, um, like anything muksa, we can we can uh, touch it, but we can't move it. So we we don't want to move the limbs. Now, if the mouth is slowly becoming more and more open, um, then you can tie up the jaw, you can tie something around the jaw, so it won't open further. Abel, however, you can't tie it in a way that it's going to close what already opened. Um, so if the, sometimes uh, with the corpse, the, the mouth slowly opens, so we can tie it so it won't open further, but we can't tighten whatever we're tied, to close the mouth back up. So what's already opened, we have to leave, but we can't prevent it from opening further. Because if we were tied up in a way that uh, is going to close the mouth, um, then that's moving a limb. And we can't move a, a limb on Shabbos. Okay. The next one, test Zion 16, is uh, similar. Um, so as I said, Shem should bless us that these laws should remain theoretical for us. Rabbi, I have a question. Yes. Uh, what happens if the corpse is in the middle of the road and if you don't move it, it's going to get run over? Okay, so that's going to um, touch on the next one. Now, although the next one we're going to speak about a fire, that would be the same thing. Any situation where there's a um, uh, danger or, you know, um, a problem for the corpse. So in the flood, the laker, so there's a fire breaks out. The Yerim Shlo Yisara for Mace, and you're concerned you, you don't want the corpse to burn. So what can you do? Now, Matarim the Tautoli Agav Dava Hetan. You can move it together with something that you're allowed to move. So let's go back a step and just discuss that principle in general. So the, the example we've given a few times has been, uh, let's say you had a tray that you put your Shabbos candles on. And on the tray was also a challah or a siddha, whatever, something that's not moksa. Now, we can't move it while the candles are lit because you can put the candle out by the, by the motion. But once the candles are burned out, um, the candlestick is still muksa. But the tray, which is also a tray for the khala and or the siddha, you're allowed to move the, uh, the siddha or the khala. So when you move that tray to move the khala or the siddha, you are, by the way, also moving 
the candlesticks. So this is the concept we're speaking about. <clears throat> so if we wanted to move the corpse, we can move it like by the way with something we're allowed to move. The Hainu. So for an example, he's going to give an example. Shemanichem alav or etzloi ezadava machal. You put on the corpse or next to the corpse an item of food. Now, uh, this is presuming the corpse is, if you're going to put it next to it, it means the corpse is on a bed or a stretcher. Uh, or if it's not on something, you put something, <coughs> excuse me, on the corpse itself. And you move both of them together. So in other words, we're moving the food, item of food, which we're allowed to move. And in that process, the corpse is also being moved. <clears throat> yes, Susan. This is provided that the body is on something that you can. If it's not on something and you have to put something under it to move it, if it's in or, the road, right? Yeah, or, or, or you put the, the item of food directly on the body and pick up the body. Okay. <clears throat> in order to carry the food. Okay. I understand now. Thank you. Now, um, there's no food available. You can put on it anything <coughs> that your that you uh, a, a utensil, household household item or clothing that you're allowed to move. Yes, Ben. If you have to look for something that is <coughs> muta to, to move, in the meantime, maybe the dead one will be will be burned. Possibly, possibly. I mean, now we're we're speaking about we're presuming it's in a house, something. So although uh, the question was asked about a road, I just wanted to finish yes. this because this gives us the the framework, and then we can discuss specifics. Okay. But. <clears throat> Let's presume at the moment a, a house, a hospital, uh, and there's usually things around. So uh, it's in the house. If there's not food, we put anything else that you're allowed to move on Shabbos, an item of clothing, uh, some type of utensil, household item, anything that is not muksa that's allowed to be moved on Shabbos. Now, the im game, the im gum ain't I. Sorry, the im gums there ayin. If even this you don't have, there's nothing. So now we're getting to the question, you know, it was a, a roadside, you know, God forbid there was an accident or something. There's uh there's there's nothing. Then then as a metaltum then you can move the body alone, just the body, just the corpse. If, if need be. So we, we want to put something on it to avoid the muksa issue. But if there is nothing um, or nothing available, nothing available in time, then we can move the, the body as it is. However, we still have uh, pro another provision over here. Bain kach or bain kach. Whether it's like this or like that. In other words, <clears throat> we have food or we have clothing or we have nothing. You can only move it in a place where you're allowed to carry. So if you're in a city where there's an Eirev, you can move it anywhere in the Eirev. If you're in a house with a fenced-in yard or something, you can move it out to, to the yard. But in a place where there's no Eirev, um, we're not going to be able to take the corpse out to the street. Or somewhere. But a place where you're not allowed to carry out to. There's no air of it's, uh, it's uh, something like that. Then you're only allowed to carry it out via a non Jew. A Jewish person cannot uh, carry the corpse out on, on Shabbos um, to a place or anything else for that matter. In a place where you're not allowed to carry on Shabbos. Now, if it was something else, you know, uh, 
let's say there was a fire and I have my favorite, um, I don't know, my favorite pair of shoes. <laughs> Make sure the shoes you can put on. But I'm just saying, if you had another object and uh, you're not really allowed to ask a non-Jew to come take it out for you. You know, if they come take it themselves, that's something else. Um, but here, because of it's a corpse, and we, you know, we have respect for the uh, the deceased and various things. We're allowed to ask uh, directly uh, a non-Jew to come uh, move it if need be. Um, and although potentially, you know, there's not time for that. I think generally well, there's not time to, to ask people, there's no one around, you know, there's only time for you to get out yourself. You know, uh, there's normally, uh, you know, if there's time to do anything, then then particularly in our cities, uh, I don't know, maybe if you lived in B'nai Brak, it's hard to find a non-Jew over there. But uh, most places, I think, where, where we're living, uh, God forbid the situation should arise, we'd be able to um, find somebody. Now, um, nothing to do with muksa, but as we were just mentioning, um, covered hamais, respect for the, the corpse of a deceased, I just thought I'd mention a few other things, not to do with Shabbos, but just uh, in, in general. So, um, Covered a mace, um, which literally means respect for the dead. Right, so we uh, we have to show respect. Now, what happens is the soul always retains a connection to the body. Um, that connection mainly, I mean, the main part of the connection ends when the person passes away. A burial, there's a greater connection is left at the end of Shiva, uh, the end of the Shloshim, the end of the 30 days, uh, the end of the first year. All, the, all, all these uh, times, that's why we, we, we mark these times, because it, it shows there's a, uh, a lessening of a connection. But there's always some connection. You know, that's why we visit the graves of loved ones. You know, if uh, I don't mean to be insensitive, God forbid, but, you know, it's... Uh, if, if the person had no connection and there's just a, uh, a lifeless body possibly decomposed in the ground, why would you bother going there? You know, uh, to look at a nice monument, what, what, what's the point of going? But as we know, the, the soul always retains some connection. So when you go, um, you can speak to them. Now, usually you don't hear them speaking back, but... Uh, um, many people will tell you at various times in their life that they've uh, perhaps felt the presence of a deceased loved one in their in their life at various times. But generally speaking, you don't you don't um, uh, you know hear them speak back to you, but they can hear you. And that's why we go. Um, <clears throat> this is why also. We'll, we'll go to pray by the grave sites of uh, holy people. Obviously, we're not praying to them. You can't pray to uh, people alive or deceased. You can only pray to Hashem, only pray to God. But um, the soul hears us praying, and they pray as well. And they're less, less inhibited because uh, they don't have a body, so less spiritually inhibited. So therefore, they can pray as well. And especially if they were a great person in their lifetime, they're even more connected um, after their passing. So that's why we do that. This is why, for example, when we go to a cemetery, we tuck in our sitters for the men. Right? We tuck in our sitters because sitters represents all the mitzvahs. The deceased can't do mitzvahs. And uh, if we're walking around uh, flaunting our sign that we can do mitzvahs, it's like... Uh, sort of saying, ha-ha, look what I can do and you can't do. And it's a little bit insulting. So that's why we tuck in our sitters at the cemetery. Um, we, same as in front of a deceased, uh, before the, before the, um, the uh, funeral, 
Uh, we don't really have Torah discussions in front of the deceased because, again, it's, it's something that, that it can't do and, it, and it, you're, you're, you're making the person feel left out. And obviously, we have to treat the body itself with, with tremendous dignity. Um, everything we do to the body, because the soul still has a connection, uh, particularly early on, they feel it like a person is alive. This is one of the reasons, uh, just one second, is one of the reasons why we don't do cremation. Because the soul, it's not the only reason, I emphasize not, but it's one of the reasons, the soul feels the body burning as if it was still in the body. So uh, not a pleasant experience. Uh, Susan, you had a question, yes. Yes. Uh... The thing I wanted to find out was if if you uh, have have to have something removed from your body and you're going to be buried uh, in a Jewish ceremony, uh, is is are you allowed to have uh, and you don't have that part of your body any longer? It it went uh, it went to the institution. Uh, are you still allowed to have a, a, a orthodox burial? Even yes, though yes, yes. I mean, if, if possible, uh, we bury any disconnected parts with the person. Yeah. But if not possible, it's not possible. You know, it's, uh, um, you know, sometimes people have surgery many years before they're passing. You know, <laughs> you know I'm not going to. Keep it in your freezer. You know, it's um, again. I'm not trying to make light of it. God forbid. I'm not trying to make a joke out of it. Uh, it no, no. I. But, I, but I you know, what, what can you do? Um, but when, whenever possible. So let's say a person had an operation, or, or or they passed away from something severing or various things. So it's available. It's there at the time. So then we we try to. So we want to bury everything together but when not possible it's 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 it's, uh, it's not possible it's not a problem rabbi warnick yes uh, you say that we're not allowed to learn torah at the um at the cemetery but at the um cover i mean uh you, well let me just backtrack a little, a little bit the the neshama is supposed to continue learning torah beyond this world you know you're saying that they might envy us because we are learning Torah at the uh, at the cemetery. Yeah. Uh, if the if the if the neshama is going to always be learning Torah and even on a higher madre guy, you know, uh, wouldn't they want us to learn Torah also uh, at the? Yeah, uh, I mean, what I'm saying is we we don't have the Torah discussion in front of them. It's because even though the soul learns Torah in, in a certain way on the spiritual levels, but the way that a physical body can learn Torah, they can't do. And therefore, it's, um, it's, it's like making fun of them. Um, so we do say Tehillim. Tehillim, uh, yes. Which is sort of like learning. But normally when we say it, we're saying it as in a way of prayer. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes in a eulogy, we'll mention a Torah concept. But that's for a different purpose. But I'm saying to sit down, let's say there's a person who is, uh, you know, watching the deceased until the burial. It wouldn't be appropriate to sit down to people and have a, a Talmudic uh, Talmud shear and, you know, when go through the give and take and the whole discussions, that's something that this soul can't, can't do in, its, in the same way in its current form. Um, so that's why they, they say Tillum. I see. Thank you. So those type of things. So um, without getting too much off the topic, at least not for much longer, we will get off the topic, but let's talk about the, the respect for the deceased. So this is one of the reasons why under normal circumstances, we don't do an autopsy, right? Because uh, it's not respect for the, the deceased. Now, there are times where we, we would, let's say for an example, uh, you know, God forbid someone, there was suspicion of foul play. And um, by doing the autopsy, they believe they could uh, find you know, who did it in order to protect other people. So then, you know, we've had this concept in, in the Shabbos laws quite a few times that Pekuach Nefesh, that a life-threatening situation overrules um, 
many of the mitzvahs. So it also overrules respect for the deceased. So that would be an example, um, you know, to an autopsy under those circumstances. But that would be very rare. Um, you know, if someone had an experimental surgery and uh, or had a certain issue that they believe, again, not just out of curiosity, that's, that's not a good enough reason, but they believe there's something that could tell them how to save someone else that has the same issue. So that might be a uh, situation. Uh, an uh, another issue is uh, organ donation. So um, majority of uh, organ donations today uh, don't go to save someone's life. They go for medical students to, I don't want to say to play with, but, you know, essentially, yes, you know, to play with. They take them out in class and although uh, or they do exams or tests, you know, it's, it's not really to save a person. So um, we would not be able, that's why we can't give a blanket, uh, as Jews, we can't give a blanket um, permission for organs to, to go somewhere afterwards. Uh, however, let's say there was a specific person, so not someone in theory who might come up if we put something in the freezer. There's right now a specific person whose life will be saved if they get the deceased heart, as an example, or lungs, or whatever it happens to be. And so there's an actual life at stake at this moment. So in the same thing, the Koach Nefesh, a life-threatening situation overrules the regular mitzvah. And then we could give that heart or what, whatever to this other person to save their life. Susan. Okay, when my mother died, when my mother died, I don't know why that's happened. When my mother died, uh, my uh, she wanted to donate her corneas uh, because it was all of her other organs were diseased and they wouldn't be of use except like what you're yeah. talking about in a in a laboratory. So, but her corneas were donated to someone else so that they could, uh, I guess, uh, uh, see or, you know, to be able to, yeah. so that, uh, and my mother was buried in, in, a, in a Jewish, you know, in a Jewish cemetery in a Jewish way. And uh, that, that was permitted, am I correct? Well, not necessarily, I think, look, I think what's done is done. So, uh, you know, sometimes, particularly, you know, if we want, aren't aware of all the issues and, and things happen, and then sometimes that's divine providence. It's the way it was meant to be. But uh, generally speaking, um, that probably wouldn't constitute a life-threatening um, situation. Right, I see. But, but I see. every case is, is, is different, you know, and there are, you know, what, what I just mentioned were general principles, mm -hmm. but every possible case, uh, you know, could be different. Mm -hmm. And uh, and therefore, you know, each case, we look case by case basis. And while we're talking about every case being different, and because I sort of got off the topic, so I'll just mention it as well, when we get back to what we're doing. Um, the facts on the ground can change. That can change everything as well. So for an example, uh, you may have heard Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, he was one of the, the in the post-war generation, the leading halachic authority, a brilliant scholar. People would, as new technologies were, were coming around or new situations in the modern world, they would ask him how to apply the halachic concepts and, and he was a master being able to look at things in you know, differently to everyone else and see how you really apply it. So they asked him in the 60s, are you allowed to do a heart transplant? And he said, forbidden. They asked him in the early 80s, are you allowed to do a heart transplant? And not only he said you're allowed, he said you must. So seemingly, it's the same question, and you got the opposite answer. But in fact, it wasn't the same question. Because in the 60s, they had to harvest the organ while the person was still halakhically alive. And the person who got the transplant didn't live that long. So the question was, 
can you kill two people to further medical research? And therefore, he said forbidden. By the 80s, they were able to harvest an organ after a person was no longer halakhically alive. And on the whole, generally speaking, people with a transplant live longer than they would have afterwards. So the question was, are you allowed to desecrate a corpse in order to save someone else's life or prolong someone else's life? Right? And so although it sounds like the same question, because the facts on the ground were different, it was a very different question. So as, as medical science advances and, and circumstances uh, will undoubtedly change, you know, some of what we discuss now may, may also um, change, not because the halakha change, changes, the halakha is Hashem's perfect, you know, God gave a, a, a perfect system that, uh, that, you know, perfection doesn't need to be updated, but the, the facts on the grounds could change, so therefore how we apply the, the Torah principles um, might change. Okay, so I hope that Is answered that everyone's right? Yes. Um, this might be a somewhat of a difficult question, and, but the thing is that it has become extremely expensive, much more so than it used to be, in order to bury a corpse, in order to have a, yes. a religious funeral. Um, one of my friends indicated, for example, that in order to have someone sent from the United States be buried from, to Eretz Israel, it costs like something like $200,000. And even if it was here in this country, it might cost something like $40,000. And um, I know of someone, I know of someone who was halachically, technically Jewish, but he was the result of a mixed marriage and uh, the, uh, the mother was Jewish, but she had passed yeah. away. So his father raised him and his brother. And he died recently, just a few years ago, although he lived to old age, but um, this fellow, because of the expense, without uh, seeking to, uh, um, you know, overburden his family with the cost or with the difficulty, he made arrangements, it was subsequently found out, to have himself cremated. And he did it like they couldn't even, they didn't even have a way to intervene when they found out about it. He had already uh, done this. He, he died of cancer. But the point I'm making is this raises the issue of where does an ordinary Jew, especially in these COVID uh, uh, monthly restricted times, get the money to actually have an Orthodox burial? Is there a way? Are there organizations that are trying to help with this? Yeah, there, there definitely are. So f first of all, um, you know, w we don't have to be transported to Israel. And 40,000 also sounds uh, a little overboard. But yes, but even what it does cost, even for 10,000, um, that can still be uh, beyond the means of, uh, of many people. Um, you know, Rabbi Smith is probably a good person to speak to um, these type of things. You know, uh, it's one of the things that he deals with in, in his organization, the United Jewish Generations, trying to ensure that, that uh, uh, people who pass away have a... Um, uh, a proper Jewish funeral, so he would have more connections in America. Now, one, one of the beauties um, in Australia, and again, I'm not, uh, unfortunately, Australia is not a good place to live in at the, at the moment with the lockdowns and, and various things. But um, one, one of the good things that the Jewish community always had was that the Hebra Kedisha, the Jewish burial society, was always, you know, it wasn't like a for profit chapel. You know, like a, people have their business. It was always a community-run uh, Jewish burial society. And um, uh, people gave donations, you know, the, the various things. And, and therefore, whoever was Jewish, um, regardless of the financial situation, something was organized. Um, 
Now, I'm sure in certain places in America that's the case. I, I know here, uh, you know, there's there's a privately owned, you know, private company that's a uh, Jewish burial society. And, um, you know, someone didn't have the means. Uh, the help wouldn't come from them. It would have to come from someone else. Um, and, again, I'm not blaming them. People have to run their, their business to be profitable. Um, but uh, the, the, our organizations, um, thank God it's not something I had to deal with whilst I was living in America, but I, I know Rabbi Smith has. And uh, if someone has questions, particularly if they have a concern about someone or even offering themselves in the future, it's really something um, that, that you can ask him. Um, I'm sure he'll be able to uh, help in some way or another. Rabbi Wernick. Yes. There's, there's an organization, and you can Google it. It's called Chesed Shell MS. And if you just do put that in, plus the state, like Florida or California, you'll find uh, a lot of people to speak to. And it's, these are, you know, exactly what you're talking about. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. I'm just putting that, what he said, on the just message to everyone. I didn't know Chesed Shell MS dealt with that. Thank you. Yeah, so I just messaged everyone so they have that. And uh, in New York, um, there's a free burial society that that buried thousands of COVID cases, Jewish COVID cases, over the last two or three years. Okay, I think so, you know what they were called. Free burial society, Jewish free burial society. Okay, so I'm just going to post that on the chat that goes to everyone as well. Jewish free. Uh, burial society. Um, they had their own cemetery in Staten Island with a, okay. with a rabbi who does the service. Okay, thank you for sharing. And uh, so I posted those for people who um, like to get it down. Um, you know, what, what I say that um, we should never let um, money get in the way of a mitzvah. It's, 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 it's very easy to say, right? It's not always the, uh, it's very easy to say, especially when you're talking about someone else's money and their mitzvahs. But um, sometimes, you know, sometimes, and again, I'm not saying everyone, but uh, sometimes um, it's a matter of, of priorities. Um, you know, uh, But sometimes be very difficult. All right. Uh, you design number 17, unless there's... Uh, yeah, yes. one quick question. Um, uh, and just before you ask, I just see someone else has uh, put to the chat another organization that's in South Florida. So um, the Shama Foundation, so if someone... Um, so it's there available if someone needs to take it down. Yeah, sorry, what you were saying... Yeah, just what a, is the name of it? Neshama Foundation. Neshama Foundation. Thank you. So my question is, uh, it says in Torah, you should know what to answer the non-believer. And if I'm trying to speak to somebody to convince them about uh, not getting cremated, I, you know, I know a lot of the details, but this, this specific thing of that the body feels the, uh, the Neshama feels the body being burned. Is there a particular source you can tell us, like from the, the Gemara, so I can say, say it says? Uh, I have to look it up. It's place. more, it, 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 I mean, it's it's from Zohar place. I mean, not not that I'm a Kabbalist and I learned it directly, but I've seen it quoted. So I have to uh, look up the the original source. Um, you know, I wasn't planning on on discussing that today, so I didn't 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 uh, look it up. It just sort of came up. Um, but you know, God willing, I'll look it up for 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 next time. Um, but it's, it's in a few places. I mean, the body, or the, the soul always has a connection, some type of connection to the body. And eventually, of course, we know uh, uh, either the beginning of the Mashiach comes or later on, depending on our merits, there's the resurrection of all the deceased and, uh, and, and the connection to the body uh, reconnects uh, stronger, actually, in a certain way than, than it was in our, in our lifetimes. So um, it, it always retains that connection. There is a connection, and it's waiting to 
to be reconnected. Rabbi? Yes. What happens, like in the case of this, this man, the luge bone is, is not found. Is, is that still the case? With the uh, resurrection? Yeah, I mean, look, it, although although there, there is a source that people who are cremated do not get resurrection of the deceased, but most people, well, first of all, unfortunately, many people uh, were, were cremated, not, not, they didn't want it, you know, let's say, well, obviously. Nazi, as, uh, as Nazi as Times as an example, so... It wasn't like they did something active themselves. It was done to them, and 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 therefore that's that doesn't count. Even I would say most people today, who not just this issue, but any mitzvah that they don't keep, most people today, is because they're not aware of of the full picture. Now they they may know that Judaism officially doesn't hold of this or doesn't hold of that, but they don't understand. The, the true importance or the whys or the how, and therefore, you know, they're, they're making misinformed um, decisions. And it's, it's almost, we still have to try and prevent it. We have to do whatever we can do to, to, to change the situation and to have things done properly. But if God forbid it happened after the fact, it's like, it's almost like it was accidental because they, they just weren't aware. You know, they don't, they don't realize the serious, the gravity of it. You know, I'll give you an example. You know, um, uh, occasionally, you know, I'll, I'll be walking home on uh, Shabbos and all of a sudden the car starts honking and whole family's out, leans out the window. Good Shabbos, Rabbi. Good Shabbos. Right. Now, they, they know it's Shabbos because they're saying good Shabbos. They may know officially that you're not meant to get in a car on Shabbos, but obviously they have no idea of the whole picture, otherwise they wouldn't do that. You know, they're not mocking me. They're generally trying to be, uh, to, you know, they're generally trying to be friendly and to wish me a good Shabbos. So, you know, I just use as example, I think, um, so even though keeping Shabbos something's very serious and that's why one of the reasons this is what we're studying here so people know how to do things properly. But many people, you know, I think there's very few people in the world who don't keep mitzvahs today, you know, on, on principle, you know, was they're knowledgeable, they, they know, they're aware of the spiritual ramifications, yet on principle they don't do it. It's people who, who just unfortunately um, haven't had the opportunity or, you know, whatever it is, the back, their background, they just don't yet know the, um, the full picture. And it's one of the reasons we have organizations like this one that, that people can learn and study. And, and if they do know, it's a good review because you've got to keep things fresh in your mind and to try and uh, get as many people as possible to, uh, to learn and to be aware. And it's a good opportunity then to make an advertisement. If you have friends and relatives that you think would like to join these classes, you know, uh, sign them up. Right? We need people, we need, we need Jews to know what Judaism really is. Okay. So number 17, unless there's any further questions on this. No? All right, very good. 17, you design. So just a quick uh, introduction. Uh, any waste product. So we're actually going to speak about, you know, uh, human waste or but, but anything like that, anything that's, uh, that's, that's um, a, a waste product or even like uh, um, food that's been left out, that's spoiled, you know, di different things. So all these things are Could have colon cancer. disgusting, they're gross. So no one wants to touch it, no one wants to deal with it on Chavez. So it has no purpose. So therefore it's moxa. However, if you just leave it, you know, let's say for an example, a, um, a child's diaper, you're just gonna let them pile up in the lounge room, it's going to become more disgusting. And in the past, you know, today we have plumbing and various things, uh, but in the past uh, people, um, you know, I don't want to be uh, disgusting, but people had buckets or bedpans and sometimes uh, people in hospitals, various things have had bedpans and, and, and different things. 
So since leaving it would be repulsive, we are allowed to remove it even though it's moksha. So that, that's the general concept. And we're going to go through the details in um, number 17 in your time. Hold over material. Anything that's disgusting. It's gross. If you're going, for example, you know, ex excrement, uh, vomit, uh, these various things. Whether they're from people or even uh, birds, you know, from, uh, from chickens, which is the least disgusting of animals. Never mind if it's uh, an animal that has more. So if it's in the house, or in your courtyard, you know, your backyard or your porch. So even though it's not in the house, but a place where you want to go, where you use it on Shabbos. You're allowed to remove them off to the garbage. And uh, the ashba here, you know, it can mean like our garbage cans, but, you know, even ashba they used to have like in the, in the towns, like a dump place. Um, so even further away, again, providing it's a place where, you, where you're allowed to carry on charts. So you're allowed to, so rule number one, you're allowed to remove it. You don't have to leave it there. In concept, it's muksa, but it's ruining Shabbos by being so uh, gross where you are. So in order to uh, stop Shabbos from being ruined, we're allowed to remove it. The mighty now, if you take out a bedpan for solids or liquids, as long as the it's still in your hands. So you take the bedpan, you pour it out wherever it goes, and it's still on your hand. So now, because the bedpan itself is, is muksa in concept because it's a gross thing. So, um, while it's still on your hand, you're allowed to return it to wherever it goes. You can put it away where it happens to go away. As we learned, well, not last week, but two weeks ago, when we learned last, anything that you're allowed to move that's muksa, as long as it's in your hand, you picked it up with permission, you can pretty much put it wherever you want it. So anything that's still on your hand, you can, you're allowed to move it and put it in any place you desire, wherever you want to put it. Avul, however, after you put it down. So the person, he poured it out and then he put it down. He's not allowed to, uh, to pick it back up. Because it's incredibly uh, gross. It's a disgusting object. And we'll just skip the brackets. Now, there is an exception to this. But if it's something, and we're going to discuss this term, cover the Brias, a little bit in a moment, but we're going to loosely translate it for now, something that's going to make embarrassment. So let's say, for an example, a person's going to be embarrassed uh, if if the bedpans on display, guess they're coming. Or if you don't have the bedpan where it's meant to be, uh, it could lead to not being able to get to it in time and cause embarrassment. E e either of these situations. If it's going to be cover the breast, the situation that causes embarrassment, then you're allowed to put it back where it goes. And we'll, we'll just finish the chat, the paragraph, and we'll just come back to this concept because it's, it's a misunderstood concept. Often, often misunderstood. Let's finish it off. Likewise, the bedpan is in a way that, you know, you give it a rinse. If you could put water in it, that an animal could drink out of it, then it doesn't become muksa anyway. You know, it doesn't have to be you actually would do it, but in concept, it could. So, you know, let's say it was a stainless steel bedpan. It can be rinsed off. Uh, you put in fresh water. In concept, again, I'm not saying that you would, but in concept, it could be clean enough for an animal. So, therefore, it's not moxa to start with.
but then you're allowed to return it. So um, just to summarize in general, um, something that is uh, gross or disgusting, uh, in concept it's muksa, but if by leaving it where it is, is going to repulse people, it's going to, you know, it's, uh, you know, just use a simple example, a child has had an accident on, in the middle of the dining room floor. You know, if you're gonna leave it there, it's just, it's just repulsive. So therefore, even though it's muksa, there's, there's an exception made, we're allowed to remove it, take it wherever it, it, it needs to go. Um, and if it was in a bedpan or something like that, the bedpan, as long as we don't put it down, we can return it. Once we put it down, then if either it could be used in theory to give water to an animal, or it's going to be embarrassing for a person to leave it where it is or not have proper access to it later, then we can return it. Otherwise, we can't. So any questions on that before we just discuss the COVID abris, the embarrassment issue? So by putting it down, you mean letting go of it, like not yes. touching it anymore. Correct. Kind of like check, kind of like checkers. Yes. Yeah, take your finger off the uh, piece, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh covered abrius, which you know it literally means that human dignity, but like I said, the situation embarrassment, you know, like I gave, gave the example, a uh, person had to use a bedpan, whatever the situation is, what can you do? And uh, unexpected guest walks in, and it's in the, the open, and they're going to feel very humiliated uh, if everyone sees it. So they're allowed to move it, even though it's muksa. Um, so some people mistakenly think that for human dignity or to avoid embarrassment, like anything goes. So generally, the rule is it only applies to something that's rabbinic. So if we just refresh our memory, muksa, meaning things that we can't move on Shabbos because they don't have a purpose on Shabbos, is, is rabbinic. Now, it's from the time of the prophets. But when we say rabbinic, we don't mean, you know, Rabbi Joe from up the road. It's from biblical times, but it was an, an, an enactment of the, the prophets, it wasn't uh, one of the 613 mitzvahs that Hashem gave us in the Torah. So the classic example that we give regularly, uh, we know we can't write on Shabbos. We're not let to write on Shabbos. That's one of the malachas, it's one of the forbidden activities. Technically, according to the Torah law, strict Torah law, we could play, hold a pen. But the concern is if you play with a pen, you know, some people like to play with things while they're talking, then he might come to, without thinking, write, doodle something, thereby transgressing Shabbos. So if we say that this pen, which has no permissible use on Shabbos, is muksa, you know, that to move it, then it puts a fence around the Torah. So the worst case scenario is someone picks up the pen, and it goes, whoops, muksa, and he puts it down. Well, if he was allowed to play with the pen in the first place, the worst case scenario is, whoops, I just wrote a paragraph. Right? So muksa is a fence to protect us from violating Shabbos. So when we say kovod abrius, we say human dignity can overrule something. It can only ever overrule a rabbinic enactment, not a Torah law. Because the Torah law, um, Hashem gave to us, you know, that's, that's, uh, this, is, this is the perfection from, from Hashem. But here we're talking about, let's say, uh, the, the bed plan. Um, okay, I mean, it has a use on Shabbos if a person needs to use the bed pen. But right now, when someone doesn't need to, to use it, it has no purpose on Shabbos. It's not, even though it might look like a bowl, no one's going to use it as a bowl. It's it's uh, it's it's a repulsive. So no, so it's therefore it's it's muksa. But here the person is going to be humiliated um, for whatever reason because it's you know unexpected guests came and they and it's it's in the middle of the of the room whatever it is. So it's only a rabbinic enactment that it's muksa. 
So therefore, the person, the you know, one second, the human dignity overrules the rabbinic enactment, but it, ne- it does not overrule a Torah prohibition. Susan, you had, you had a question. I, I'm now. I'm even more confused. Yeah, you have to unmute. We can't hear. I am uh, now. I'm even more confused. Uh, if the bedpan, if there's nothing in it, and it's under the bed, and there's nothing in it, and the person needs to use it, you can't give it to them. No, 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 no. We're not talking about when you need to use it as a bedpan. What what I mean is like this. Let's say a bedpan, in a certain respect, today today's bedpans. It's a stainless steel bowl. Not much different. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to be gross. I just want to no, no, black no, and I, white. I, I, not much different to your salad bowl. Yet, you will obviously not use this bowl for a salad bowl. Because of what it's used for, it's gross. Even though in theory, maybe it's been disinfected. You know, it's... Uh, it's, can I give it to the person to use? Yeah, to use as a bedpan, can use it. We'll come out when it's not being used as a bedpan. I see. Okay. At, the, at the time, it's not being used as a bedpan. It doesn't have a purpose on Shabbos because you, would, you wouldn't use it for anything. And even using it as a bedpan is also this concept of, uh, you know, human dignity. You know, that's that's because uh, um, not using a bedpan is worse. You know, it's, 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 uh, so the fact that it overall, so, so, so let's, I'll give an example. Yeah. Let's say there were lots of mosquitoes and I'm not talking about whether carrying this malaria and various things, just in a regular case where, where, you know, um, they're uncomfortable. Um, so we can't take the life of any creature on Shabbos. Um, so we can't take out the spray and start spraying all the mosquitoes um, on Shabbos. Now, I heard someone say this once, and they were mistaken that oh, covered debris is human dignity. Therefore, I you know you're allowed to do this. It doesn't apply in this case because that's that's a, a biblical. It's one of the six hundred thirty mitzvahs of the Torah. It's a real malach. It's not something human being doesn't doesn't overrule that. But in a case like here, where it's muksa is is rabbinic, and again, we're not making it sound less important. We need to do all the rabbinic misses as well. But when the decree was made, it was made with the exception that a case where human dignity is, is, a, is at stake it doesn't apply. Now. I've given you a very blanket uh, statement. They say it doesn't apply. There will be certain rabbinic things where it always applies. You know, we have to uh, look at case by case. I'm just saying in a general concept, if if whenever covered abrius, human dignity, overrule something, it's always a rabbinic um, issue. Um, so that's 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 that one. Okay. Yudches, number 18. This is, uh, any more questions? Muta litain kli tachas adelif b'shabas. A person can put a utensil, you know, a bowl, a bucket, under a leak on Shabbos. So it's uh, the roof, the ceiling starts to leak. God forbid, you know, but it happens. We had it in our house, it was ironic, not this past one, but the year before, Parshas Noyach, right? the Parsha of Noah and his flood, there was a torrential downfall here, it was like, normally doesn't rain, it was like, and it was flooding, it was like ankle deep, you know, which is a big thing for here, and our roof started to leak, on top of one of my bookshelves, right, Marosh we got it in time, you know, uh, um, you know, put a plastic tablecloth over it, and got the bucket there, and everything, and so you're allowed to put something on Shabbos. Now, in concept, you might think you can't because we've learned that a noilid, something that came into the world didn't exist before. So an example would be a chicken egg that was laid on Shabbos. It wasn't there before Shabbos. It wasn't in the world before Shabbos, at least in its form. And it came out on Shabbos. So you can't use that 
uh, it's muksa on Shabbos. So the rain also was in the clouds, you know, wasn't wasn't uh, in this world on Shabbos. The concept is muksa. Nevertheless, we are allowed to put the bucket there to uh, to protect um, you know the property things. And not only we're allowed to put put the bucket there. In this money, if the bucket becomes full, you're allowed to take the bucket, pour it out. So you're allowed to move this rainwater, which is muksa, and well, potentially muksa, and put the bucket back even to get refilled another time. Now, there are some conditions on this. So this is the general concept. We can put it there. Now the conditions. This is um, if the water is clean enough to wash in. Now, today we're very spoiled. I just want to mention today we're very spoiled. There is a lot of water that we wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole today that 100 years ago people happily drank, never mind washed in. So... It may not, the rainwater that went through the roof and the ceiling and various things, we may personally decide not to have a bath in that. But technically, it's you could, right? It's not it's not dirty or polluted. Um, you know, it's not gonna make us sick. Avo, if it's revolting water, you know, let's say the rainwater came through uh I don't know, came through uh, an underground something that was just just revolting. Also, lit ancient kli. You can't put a vessel to collect it. Because you can't make the bedpan, even though it's not actually bedpan, but that category of bedpan. So although we said, if it's made, you know, someone had to use a bedpan, you're allowed to remove it. But you're not allowed to create these situations. Um, now, if the sewage is leaking, the leak is a sewage pipe, you know, God forbid, then you're not making the situation. It, it's, it's already coming on its own. So you can put whatever you need to do to make it not get worse. But, you know, this water, if it's, you know, you've got some dirty, slightly dirty water, it's, 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 it's uh, coming out, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world. But if you're going to make a collection of it, then it's going to be revolting. That you can't. Put the bucket and collect. Now, if a person they didn't realize they did put something there, and uh, now they have they have something gross in a in a you know it's in the middle of the dining room. So, in this place for you to have this thing here is 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 gross. Not to the ti. You're allowed to take it out. You don't have to leave it there. We don't say since the person uh, put it there illegally, so bad luck. Now you have to uh, get stuck with it after Shabbos. You know, it uh, was uh, now it's ended up in a place. It's collected and it's in the middle of the dining room and it's, it's uh, not pleasant. Um, we're allowed to remove it. Okay, and then in the brackets it just where it says where it's going to discuss some other aspects of this uh, in other chapters. All right. Any any questions on on that? Yes. Susan. Okay, if this if the vessel that you collected the water in the water becomes rancid, yeah. You can take it outside and throw it out in the dirt. It's okay and bring the vessel back in. Uh we can take it outside and get rid of it. Now in the dirt is going to depend, you know, we we Probably Wait, before you learned, you joined the class. Actually, the first class that I gave in this year was about whether the situations when you're allowed to pour water outside because it can be like watering plants and various things. But let's let's keep it simple. Let's say there was a, a cement pavement, so you can pour it out on the pavement. You know, on the dirt, it depends if there's anything growing there or or right, okay, or how close to things that are growing. But you can take it out and throw it out. Yeah, okay. All right. You mentioned before about the the egg that was laid on Shabbos. Yes. So is that a it's a problem? I'm just trying to clarify. It, to move it is muksa, but to eat it 
is an actual biblical prohibition or no? Yeah, well, you can't you can't eat it without without moving it. No, but the moving itself is rabbinic; it's muksa. But the eating itself is biblical because you're not allowed to benefit from something that was produced on Shabbos. Um, I believe it's it's all it's all uh, rabbinical. It's a muksa issue. It's, um, it's, no, it's it's I'll go back. It's 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 you can't use it biblically, and therefore it becomes muksa rabbinically. Can't even now touch it. It's no lot. It's no lot on sure. No, that's right. So no, you can you cover it, it, protect it. So you could put, let's say, uh, upside down bowl on it or something to stop it getting crushed. But you can't. You can't um, move it on shops. Can you use it after Shabbat? Yes. Yes. It? After Shabbos. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The only things that you can't use after Shabbos would be if someone deliberately on Shabbos, again, deliberately doesn't mean they don't know any better. Deliberately, so let's say for an example, a person knows all about Shabbos and they know the laws and they know the spirituality behind it. And nevertheless, they decided to uh, cook something on Shabbos. So then, then you couldn't even eat it after Shabbos. Well, Different cases, say with someone, they, you know, they didn't know that you can't cook on Shabbos. And they cooked it on Shabbos, God forbid. And so now uh, you can't use it on Shabbos, but you can use it after Shabbos. But the time that it would take to make it, so you don't benefit from the Shabbos. Let's say, for example, it took 45 minutes to cook. You can't eat it till 45 minutes after Shabbos. Because if you would eat the second after Shabbos, you benefited from it being cooked actually on Shabbos. So you would wait the, you know, the, the time that it takes to make it. So Rabbi, to clarify, um, I don't know if you can hear me properly. Um, yes. Just to clarify, uh, the Eruv Tav Shilin is when we're cooking on the Chag in order to provide for Shabbat. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I guess we've uh, run out of time for today. So tomorrow we start a new chapter, and we're going to look at things that are not necessarily muksa themselves, but they become a base to muksa. So we mentioned it briefly, by the way, you know, we mentioned this, it was a bowl and people put their loose change in it. So the bowl itself is not muksa, but now it's full of coins. Various things, so we'll, we'll get into that, God willing, next week. And wish everyone an amazing Shabbos, a wonderful week. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you very much. Stay safe, Success, everybody. happiness, good health, and fulfillment. Mm. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Good Shabbos. Shabbos, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone.